Welcome back, everybody, to another TLC conversation. Today, we're talking with Chad Sanderson, a longtime TLC member, not first-time caller. Thanks for coming back. We really appreciate it. Um, he's going to share with everybody the um, uh, conversation or uh, presentation that he did at CXL Live, uh, which led to lots of follow-up conversations with other TLC members. So we wanted to ask him to come back and share that presentation and then also open it up for more time for questions and discussion. So thank you very much, Chad. Um, before we get started, uh, I want to remind everybody about the TLC YouTube channel. Um, all of our prior conversations, as well as the one we record today, um, are over there on the channel. That's the, the link. I also have the link in the TLC Slack. Also the stickers, which I just referenced. Uh, there is the, the link for you right there. Um, if you want to uh, get a sticker, I'll happy to send it to you. And if you have any specific topic suggestions, um, you can use the, the Zoom chat, the TLC Slack, or you can just email me um, with any suggestions you have. All right, so let's get started. I'm gonna stop share and let you uh, share so that you can control the, the pace. Okay. Cool. Perfect. All right, there we go. Does that look good to everybody? Looks perfect. Awesome. Okay. Um, so first of all, thanks uh, Kelly and the rest of the TLC team for having me back to do this. We had a, a fun time at CXL Live uh, sitting through this presentation, so I'm happy that uh, they didn't get too bored of it and wanted me to do it a second time, which is almost a never, never the case with my talks. Most of the time, I'd say we saw that once. Uh, I think we're about done with that. Let's move on to the next one. So I know, it's kind of a, <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so a little bit about, about me, if you're um, not super familiar with who I am, um, I am a PM on the Microsoft analysis and experimentation team. So our team owns uh, a tool called EXP and EXP is the experimentation platform that uh, services the rest of Microsoft. So anytime Bing or Xbox or Office or Windows or Outlook wants to run an experiment, then they're running it uh, through our service and there are all sorts of uh, features that come along with that. Um, we do have a pretty big team. It's about 110 people, uh, roughly 40 data scientists, around uh, 60 developers and seven or eight PMs. And we are hiring, by the way. Um, so I'm just going to throw that out there. So the purpose of this um, talk, uh, what we're focusing on here, or what I was focusing on for the conference uh, rather was this uh, delineation that I was starting to see crop up a lot between the way that we think about experimentation within marketing teams and the way that we think about experimentation within uh, product teams. Um, especially at a company like Microsoft, uh, when you're coming from more of a marketing centric world, which I was, um, then that difference is extremely, extremely clear. And the way that the two different types of companies ap approach experimentation actually has some uh, very um, impactful outcomes further down the funnel. So that's going to be sort of the goal of the presentation. And um, hopefully I can kind of make my case here on why these two things are different and maybe what you should do, uh, depending on what side of the aisle you fall. So I, I do think it's it's usually good, um, and this crowd is probably uh, a little bit more uh, in line with the common definitions of product than your traditional uh, sort of marketing crowd or the uh, traditional uh, CRO type of crowd, which is okay. Um, but it's, it's kind of important, I think, to get a, a pretty firm understanding of exactly what I mean by product. Uh, product and the, the, the differences between product and marketing, especially at uh, smaller companies, those lines are, are pretty blurry. Um, so a good metaphor to use, I find, is looking at the, the life cycle of car from its development all the way to the sales floor to uh, when it actually ends up in a customer's hands and they're, they're driving it around. So um, I break it out into three uh, primary areas. Obviously, there's more. But in this case, there's a sort of an engineering component, a sales component, and then the actual product component, where the primary focus of engineering is really on uh, production, and it's on safety and reliability. And it makes a lot of sense um, why this is actually most important. 
you certainly don't want a car that blows up on the highway as a customer is driving it. That's probably the, the worst uh, case possible outcome that could happen to you. And there's all sorts of like protocols and safety checks that a vehicle has to pass inspection before it actually makes its way out onto the, to the sales floor. So the primary metrics here are safety and stability and reproducibility and these types of things. Um, sales is obviously a little bit different. That's uh, the, the main focus there is sort of the dollars and cents side of things, right? Like a customer walks on to the sales floor of, you know, Nissan or Honda or something like that. And a good salesperson is able to talk to them and figure out what they want and understand their user persona and find the, the best car that fits their needs. It's the market aspect of marketing, right? looking at the segmentation. So it's generating the purchases. And then, but after that, there's the product piece. And I think oftentimes on very marketing heavy team, uh, marketing centric teams, the product piece can oftentimes go uh, ignored or underappreciated. And this is what happens when the product actually gets into the hands of the consumer and what they end up doing with it. So uh, my parents, for example, have been driving a Honda Odyssey for the last 15 years. It's the exact same brand and they just keep buying the new year over and over and over again. And that's not a, that's not a sales thing. No salesman had to, had to resell the Honda Odyssey every single time. There was one sale that happened and then the car did the selling uh, in the future. And that actually generated much more uh, money down the road. So lifetime value, satisfaction, churn, these types of things are very important. Um, key to remember, again, this is something I think probably most people on this call understand, but it's always a good reminder to have is that it's the product that is the most central aspect of the business, whatever, whatever that product happens to be. And so the closer to the product you are, then the more pull you actually have when it comes to decision making. That's all types of decision making. That's um, obviously product based decision making what are the features that are going out it's budgeting based decision making what are the tools that we're using um, so the closer you are obviously the, the the easier it is to sort of get those things given to you um, I like to split things up between three primary uh, types of companies because each one of these companies actually has a very different way of approaching the uh, their products and how digital interfaces with their products so the first is tech first and these are what we traditionally think of as technology companies. So Microsoft would fall in here, but there's divisions of Microsoft like Bing. Um, then there's Yahoo, LinkedIn, which is also um, owned by Microsoft. And in these cases, it's the technology that actually is the product. So the website is the product. That is the thing that the customers are actually consuming at the end of the day. A tech second company is one that, that sort of serves as the bridge between the online world and the offline world. Like Booking.com, the, the, the final product Product that the customer is really consuming there is you know a hotel uh, room visit right but the website is sort of the intermediary between the person not having that visit and and having it and so there's there's still uh, for all intents and purposes these are still tech first companies oftentimes and how they operate internally but not necessarily how they are are uh, used by the outside world and then finally I think this is uh, the most common or at least it's the most common when it comes to these sort of uh, large-scale digital technical innovations and changes and I'm adding optimization and I've never done it before type of companies um, which are those where the, the product is actually something offline uh, so something that doesn't exist on the internet and the web or the mobile application is a portal in order to get the thing that you actually want to do which the company also invests money in so I actually used to work at both Sephora and Subway um, Subway in particular uh, when you go onto the online portal, usually you're you're using it in order to find directions to get to a Subway restaurant, or you're using it to place an online order to get a Subway sandwich. So, so again, in these cases, the the digital experience is really um, just uh, just a portal. And to quickly kind of, uh, there, this sort of causes some major changes to happen in the internal structure of these organizations, right? Because product in a tech first company like I mentioned, it is the technology, but the technology in a, in a product third company is a portal. And so, like I said, the closer you are to the product, the, the, the thing that people are actually consuming, then the more weight that you actually have within the business. So in many cases, like tech third companies, it's actually the marketing team that is running the experimentation side of the platform because they are closer to selling the physical product than the product team that's more of um, this is how you get to the product, right? 
And so that leads to this split in uh, two relatively distinct types of experimentation platforms or programs, I should say. There's an optimization centric uh, program and there's a validation centric program. Optimization is more of this marketing side, um, uh, sort of a tech third type of business and validation is more tech first, tech second, um, uh, more of uh, engineering uh, driven experimentation. Um, so some, some sort of clear features of each one of these different types of programs is an optimization. Uh, generally speaking, the, the main goal is to move revenue-based metrics, move those marketing sales metrics. We want to increase revenue, increase conversion rate, increase uh, average order value. And in many cases, there are experiments that are being designed for uh, specifically for the purpose of doing that. So it's less that there are features that are coming through from uh, product teams and engineering teams that are being experimented on and more on and more like there's a there's a group of people oftentimes marketers that are coming up with a B tests to run to increase the metric um, and then in validation this is this is actually not the case in in validation very frequently the experiments are 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 very rarely marketing driven and they're more uh, uh, built into the product development life cycle. So when you have a feature that is being developed by an engineering team, then that feature will go through experimentation. And this kind of goes back to the safety checks thing I mentioned before. Experimentation is used as an arm of safety uh, rather than an engine to generate uh, additional sales. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, really quickly, here's an example of, because uh, uh, I, I think most people are probably least familiar with this validation approach. I think the, the optimization-based approach is kind of more common in the CRO world, uh, but this is an example in Microsoft um, where we use this uh, validation style uh, experimentation. So there was a team at, at Microsoft, and that team will remain nameless for the moment, but they were migrating a core piece of uh, backend infrastructure. So this was something that um, it was going to help the dev team perform better. You'd have a little cleaner uh, sort of backend code base to work with. Uh, it, there's a lot of there's a lot of reasons that it would help on the back end, but it, it wasn't so much of a of a, a customer facing thing, of a front end thing that we would expect to move our our uh, like engagement metrics, for example. Um, but this particular team, they run uh, everything that they deploy, they run it through an experiment, even if it's the smallest bug fix, okay? And yet when they did this, they saw a pretty noticeable drop in these uh, sort of front end engagement metrics. And what it turned out was happening um, was that there was another feature that was being shipped, it was actually being experimented on, that took a dependency on the infrastructure that was being migrated away from. And so these, these two experiments were actually colliding with each other and resulting in a, in a bad experience for the users. And so if this product had just, if they just shipped it, then we would have seen this big drop off and, and we would have been ghost chasing when the engineering teams tried to figure out what was causing it. Nobody would have any idea. Um, uh, and, and the first sort of, uh, the first set of investigatory practices would have been, okay, well, did we build this correctly? And the answer is, is yes, you did. It had nothing to do with whether or not you, you uh, built it poorly. Um, so, so to sort of frame the, the context of validation and, and a big question that comes up when you're talking about this type of experimentation, uh, especially from marketing teams is, well, what, what is the ROI on that? How much money is, is doing A-B testing in this way making? Very, very, very often, A-B testing is linked back a hand in hand to money and to dollar signs. Um, and so there's three different particular, three different types of outcomes that I kind of like to walk through here. Um, and this is in a validation based framework. So there's, you have an experiment uh, on a particular feature and that feature generated you a $5 million over the course of an experiment. And let's say that happened in two weeks. And then you have another feature that generated you negative $5 million. So it actually lost money and that was over the same period of time. And then you had another experiment on some feature and that, and that did nothing. Um, so it's kind of interesting to think about what is the actual ROI of experimentation or uh, more specifically of validation in each one of these situations. Well, in the first case, the ROI uh, is actually negative $5 million. And I know that's a, a bit confusing to kind of wrap your head around at first, but when you think about it, it starts to make a little, a little bit of sense, right? Because if we think about the counterfactual, so what would have happened if we didn't have an experimentation platform, if we didn't have the ability to do experimentation, but this was still a feature on the roadmap, which is my 
kind of assumption when we're talking about validation, right? Um, obviously, that's not true in all cases, but just for the, this particular case. Well, we would have just deployed that feature, right? It would have just gone out to people. And if it's making $5 million on a 50% split, then that means it would have made $10 million on a 100% split in the same time period. So the fact that we had experimentation actually caused us to make less money than what we would have gotten otherwise. So you could also reason that this would have been zero instead of negative five. Um, but either way, you're not really generating any new money by having experimentation in this, in this context. So same with the negative $5 million, the, the belief may be, okay, well, in this case, we're saving money, right? Because in, in the first case, we would have had plus 10 million. In the, in the second case, we would have had negative 10 million. So we're actually saving 5 million. Well, actually, no, right? Just because it's impossible to generate ROI, um, which is uh, net profit, um, if you have a negative. So we, we didn't make anything. There's absolutely no way we could generate ROI on, uh, in this situation either. And even when nothing happens, there's still a negative ROI, which might be confusing given my previous two answers. But when you think about it, this one kind of makes sense too, because there is a cost to running experiments as well. There's uh, there's um, a, a physical manpower cost, whereas you have to pay a designer and an engineer to set this up. You have to pay for your experimentation platform. You have to pay um, in hours to set up feature flags, even though it might be uh, relatively quick. You need to pay an analyst to go in and sort of dig through all the data and figure out what the result is. So this is also not a free option. And when you look at this from a validation perspective, you can kind of see that there's really no situation where you're making money from a validation based framework. Um, but so the next question is, well, okay, if I'm not making any money, then why should I be doing validation? Why does Microsoft do it this way? Why does Facebook do it this way? Well, in order to answer that question, the real question you need to answer is how important is insurance? Right? I pay insurance every single month, um, pay for home insurance, I pay for uh, my life insurance, I pay for my health insurance. I don't do that because I'm expecting to make money. I'm doing that to, to safeguard myself in the event of a disaster or a catastrophe happening. Right? So if something really, really bad uh, happens to me, if I'm just out you know, driving one day and some guy T-bones me, I'm in, a, I'm in a really bad accident, if I didn't have insurance, I would be way, way worse off than if I put in a little bit of money every single month that's never going to generate any ROI for me. And so this is actually a concept that was really made popular by uh, Nassim Taleb, who's a statistician and a philosopher. He wrote a, f a pretty famous book called Black Swan that was about um, outliers and, uh, and, and what happens, uh, how you should sort of uh, live life and how you should approach your business when you have these massive outliers that can immediately transform your business from a success to a failure uh, overnight. And the argument here is that it's actually more important to guard against catastrophic failure than it is to constantly focus on incremental gains because a single catastrophic failure can wipe out all your gains uh, in a day. Right. So, so the real value of validation, in my opinion, is always making sure that the things that we're doing are neutral or positive or even, you know, very, very slightly negative and, and reducing the chance of us running into uh, a, 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 a creating a major risky decision. Um, good example of that Snapchat, hopefully nobody from Snapchat's on the line. Um, uh, but Snapchat put out a, a really big redesign in um, uh, last year or maybe it was 2017. It was one of those two years got major, majorly, majorly bashed. And then if you remember, they actually IPO'd um, not too long after that or not too long before, it was one or the other. But either way, it's not great to go into an IPO with uh, really horrific press on your redesign. And ever since then, there's been sort of like this steady drop off and they're, they're not in great shape now. So if they had run an experiment, not necessarily to focus on how much money they were making, but just to focus on, is this redesign going to kill us? Um, that would have been a really wise use of their, uh, of their resources. Um, so then there's the optimization side of things, right? So good part of a good side of optimization is that it's, it's ROI positive. If you're running an, an AB test on the marketing side and you get the thumbs up and it's making revenue, then you know that unlike validation, you've actually generated revenue that otherwise would not be there if it weren't for you. On the other side, there's a lot of risks that come along with the type of tools that are involved very frequently with uh, marketing style uh, experimentation. And I think if you separate the marketing 
from the engineering when we're primarily talking about something that is an engineering and data science thing, um, you're eventually going to, to run into trouble where, where those two lanes intersect and one group's going to want one thing and the other group is going to want another thing and, and that's kind of a whole hassle to deal with. Um, so uh, I don't really think I need to spend too much time on this one because everybody's probably familiar with this type of A-B test, um, but uh, there was a, a Skype experiment that was run on uh, the language used in uh, syncing your uh, contacts. So you can see all these different versions of the language that was used there. And uh, what they actually found was that even though there were some pretty distinct winners in the United States, when these language versions were translated across the world, um, there were some versions that translated uh, much, much better and had a much, much stronger impact depending on the country uh, that they were focusing on. And so because of that, that they could activate that particular version in that country and make a whole bunch of money, and this was obviously ROI positive, and uh, it was great and everybody was happy. But on the downside, um, something that I like to talk about, and I honestly, this is, this is something I'll say to this group and not necessarily something that I'll say to the, to the conference group because at a conference, you know, you've got like sponsors and people who are actually paying for the conference to exist uh, that may own uh, third party uh, vendor programs. But I kind of, I think that there's a reckoning uh, coming for JavaScript based tools just in general. Um, I think that that there's a lot of teams, uh, especially at Microsoft certainly, but at a lot of the larger companies that either don't use these tools at all or try to minimize them as much as possible. And this is a really big reason for that. And that's this, this concept of, of page speed uh, being a massive killer. Um, so here, this is kind of a hypothetical that I want everybody to, to think about, especially if you're using like a, a, a front end um, client side uh, experimentation platform. Which is so. Let's say that you've, your system is super, super, super optimized. Um, it doesn't matter one way or the other. Your A/B testing tool, where you have a single line of JavaScript added to the header of page, is going to add latency. That's just uh, unfortunately, it's a fact of life. Um, so there is a, a an agency called uh, Orange Valley, and uh, I think uh, back in 2015 or 2016, they actually measured the latency impact of all of the popular A/B testing tools. Um, that were added via this, this single line of JavaScript on the page. And um, what they found was that zero of those tools, um, or to put another way, all of them increased that latency by a, a minimum of 1,000 milliseconds, which is an eternity in Microsoft time, by the way. Uh, but let's sort of, sort of go through this, this hypothetical scenario where your client-side tool is increasing PLT by 1,000 milliseconds on desktop, on 2,000 uh, 2, milliseconds on mobile, and 4,000 milliseconds at the 90th percentile on, on mobile, meaning that the users who have the slowest internet connections um, on their mobile devices, the, the sort of the, the top, the 10%, the 10 that are the slowest, right? So if we assume that every 100 milliseconds delay causes roughly a half a percentage decrease in revenue per visitor, and I'm not pulling that number, that number from nowhere, by the way, that's very similar to the number that Bing found when they actually ran an experiment to understand the impact of latency on uh, user behavior. Amazon did the same thing. They also got a similar number. So if we assume that and just assume that there is a linear scale here, then on desktop, revenue would fall by 5%. It would fall by 10% on mobile, and it would fall by 10% uh, by 20% on mobile at the 90, 90th uh, or 95th percentile, right? So, um, if you think about what this means in terms of these marketing organizations, there's there's a chance that by by just running your AB by running your AB testing platform at all, you're introducing a delay that is hurting your revenue significantly. And in order to actually generate any ROI, you have to make up that revenue difference before you start uh, adding to the profit. So let's say that that costs you $10 million. Well, first you have to run $10 million of successful experiments before you get to the positive ROI. There's a lot of other issues that come with client-side experiments that we could kind of talk about all day, um, but, but this is one of them to kind of keep in mind. So those are um, the, the two types, the two primary types of uh, experimentation I see, generally speaking, but there is a third type and that's um, experimental research. 
So in validation, the goal is safety, right? We want to make sure that we're not losing. In optimization, the goal is revenue. We want to make sure that we're winning as much as possible. But in research, our goal is understanding. So we're not trying to sell. Um, we're trying to learn uh, about the customer so that we can use it to either sell or you know, build a feature or, or, or do something else. We're really going after an interesting result. So if you've ever read an academic paper or you've read an ac uh, papers that have been uh, some academic journal somewhere, this is the, the, the criteria of interesting is usually the bar that a paper has to pass before it gets into any one of these journals. Um, and you might be saying, okay, well, what, what's kind of the, the practical uh, outcome of that? How would I analyze such an experiment to see if it, was, if it was good or bad? Well, in this particular case, you wouldn't actually care if the result is good or bad. And I'll, I'll show you some examples. So one is, is a slowdown experiment that I actually mentioned a little bit earlier. So Bing ran this um, uh, about five, six years ago, something like this. And uh, what, they, what they were trying to understand was whether or not, what, was how much uh, page load time, how much latency actually affected user engagement. They weren't, obviously they were not trying to uh, increase their revenue with this experiment, right? They weren't trying to make the user experience better for some reason. They instituted a server-side slowdown so that they could see what happened when people were given a worse experience. And then when they got that number, um, they were able to do all kinds of things with it, right? If someone had some new JavaScript uh, tool that they wanted to add, uh, then they could say, well, if it increases the latency by X much, we know what that, the, the proportional revenue loss is going to be based on this experiment. Um, one thing that you do really need to be careful of um, with this type of experimentation, though, is that I find if it's, if it's done without a lot of oversight, then it could lead to some pretty nasty uh, social media um, backlash or, or media backlash, as was the case in, uh, for Facebook. So Facebook did an emotional contagion study where they uh, essentially tried to, to, to show people more negative statuses, uh, so one group more negative statuses and show another group more positive statuses, and then measure if that actually had an impact on um, the number, uh, uh, what type of statuses people were actually posting about. And it turned out that people with very, very negative statuses actually posted more negative things more frequently. This is incredibly interesting. Um, uh, I've, there's a lot that you could do with that information, but to the media and to sort of the common person, that looks a lot like emotional manipulation, which it kind of is. Um, and so the question is, should there be some sort of IRB or an internal review board that looks at the ethics of these types of decisions? So that's something really important to keep in mind. Uh, here is the uh, general breakdown of how I like to think about the sphere of experimentation and where uh, these different uh, experimental types uh, fall in terms of their value to the organization. As you can see, we didn't really talk about velocity that much, but if you have a really good uh, validation program where you're, you're experimenting on every single thing that goes out the door, you're going to have really high velocity. The opportunity to have high velocity uh, is, is there. Return on investment obviously is going to be higher in optimization because that's the goal. Uh, the learnings are going to be the highest in, on research and your ability to quantify risk is going to be the highest on uh, validation. Um, so, so the next question is, all right, so now that I kind of, now that we kind of understand the, the landscape, um, how do we go about deciding uh, what are some good metrics to use on a, each one of these experimental types individually, and then on the entire experimentation program as a whole. Um, these are not necessarily all things that I use. It really depends on what your primary goal at the business is. Um, but a, some of these are, are, are meta metrics. So conversion rate of winning experiments is one that you could look at if you're driving more of a marketing style experimentation approach. Validation coverage percentage is one that I like a lot. Um, if you're focusing more on feature delivery, because then the question that you can uh, ask uh, teams is, hey, how many features went out the door? How many deployments were there that had an experiment attached to them? And what should that number be? And what, would, what is the risk of not having whatever that percentage is? So if I'm testing 50% of features that go out, uh, what is the risk on 50% of features uh, not being experimented on? Uh, research conversion frequency is another one. So this one is of the research that we do, how much of it led to a successful experiment or a successful feature uh, at some point in the future. 
Um, another another uh, great metric to look at, and this will be the last metric that I show, but this is understanding the split of the type of uh, the different types of experiments that you can run. So you might say, for example, that in 2018, 70% of all the experiments that we ran across the organization were focused, were optimization based, and the rest were validation based. Is that actually a good number? Uh, is that where we want to be? And did that uh, deliver the results that we uh, we think? Like, what what is the ceiling of the experimentation program, and and how well uh, does this do? It's sort of inching us closer to the top of that ceiling. Um, another thing I kind of wanted to uh, uh, chime in on a, a little bit here, just in terms of sort of how you can uh, think about applying this to your organization or the organization of other companies you work with, if you're an agency or something like that, is is thinking about the the intersection of all of these different types of experimentation. Um, so something I find happens very very frequently is, especially in like optimization based organizations, there's a much higher risk of being fired. Uh, if you don't deliver some revenue goal in a very particular amount of time. Uh, I've actually had, I've known people who said, well, you know, you're not delivering very clear A-B testing outcomes. It's hard for me to tie back the revenue that you're saying you're delivering to my, my P&Ls. And I could be investing that money in a place where I know it's going to deliver me value, right? I could, I could uh, invest it all into PPC, for example, or I could invest it all into advertising. And I know that's going to deliver me something. Whereas in a validation-based framework, usually people aren't asking those questions because it's accepted that uh, the risk would be would be too great. Okay. Um, so some some five steps to success here that I think are are good uh, action items to take away from this presentation is uh, step one would be understanding sort of the current structure of your organization. So what what is what is actually most valuable and which team kind of holds the purse strings? Is it the marketing team? Are you more on that sort of like Subway, Sephora? Um, the product is something physical and the digital team doesn't really interface with them that much? Or is it more like Bing, where the product is uh, something it is something digital? And the, the, it's the product team that is really deciding uh, the direction of things, uh, the direct direction of the entire company. Number two is figure out where the coverage is, is lacking. Um, are you actively monitoring the ROI of all the experiments that you're running? Is that something that you, you feel that you need to be doing? Um, are you monitoring how many features are being deployed? Just in general, by the way. Um, obviously, engineering teams are usually monitoring this, but sometimes like when it comes to when it comes back to the product or it comes back to marketing, that's, that's uh, kind of obscured away and, and invisible. Um, and then what percentage of those are actually um, being shipped with experiments? Number three is in bridging that gap. So depending on where you sort of thinking about the structure of where you want to be and then making the connections of uh, how you get there, right? So it's starting that conversation, opening things up to a perspective of this, this is maybe how we should be moving forward. I find that uh, validation teams are less likely to want to depend on the marketing side because they think that marketers don't provide very much value. Uh, personally, I think that there is a, a huge amount of value in marketers doing experiments. Um, I think that feature teams can focus on features and marketers can focus on um, a lot of the learnings that come out of those features. I think marketers usually have really great ideas because they're often thinking about things in a very different way than, than product teams are. Um, four is establishing a forum for sharing results and working on joint projects. Um, this is sort of the, uh, a big problem at teams, uh, teams that happen, the uh, teams that are scaling experimentation, um, and especially where there's, there's product silos. So like a Facebook example would be, there's a product around messenger or there's a product team around messenger. There's a product team around the newsfeed. There's a product team around something else. Um, it's hard to run experiments across all of those products. Very easy to run experiments within the products. Um, so having some type of joint forum where you're thinking about those types of cross product experiments is, is very helpful. Um, and then a monthly meeting where you actually decide on program metric goals, like the ones we just talked about, and review them and say, how well are we um, actually moving towards our progress? Uh, so I, I hope that was helpful. Um, you, this, is the, this is the last slide of the presentation. Um, so now I guess we can open some things up to discussion. Absolutely. All right, so I um, have a couple of questions so far already in the, the Slack. You guys don't forget you can add your questions at any time or take yourself off mute and ask. Um, but first, let's, if you wouldn't mind, um, you, when you were talking about uh, tech first, second, and third, 
Um, shortly thereafter, when you flipped to um, talk about validation versus optimization, mm -hmm. you, you stated that tech first companies are um, more, tech first and second companies are more focused on uh, product validation and tech third on optimization. But the way you yeah. stated it almost sounded like they only did that. Are you saying that no. that is the case or should be the case? No, 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 not at all. It, so oftentimes it, a lot of it depends on the maturity of the company. Um, I definitely don't think that that should be the case. In fact, I think the opposite. Uh, I think that, that there should be some joint unification of those two different styles of, of experimentation. I think that's kind of where the industry is, is headed, uh, frankly speaking. But I do think that depending on which which bracket they fall into, whether they're tech first or tech second or tech third, that's kind of how they skew, right? So a company like Bing is going to skew very, very heavily towards validation, whereas a Subway is they, going to- they, they are the product. That's, that's correct. They're going to skew very heavily in that, in, in that direction. And the problems happen uh, very frequently when, um, like at a tech third company, when you have the engineering team that oftentimes is not, extremely involved in the experiments that the marketing team is doing, getting this idea and realizing, hey, wait a second, we're running A-B tests on the site. Did, like, who actually approved this tool? Like, who is actually, is anybody actually measuring the performance impact of this thing? Like, couldn't we use this to also run our experiments? We can't use it because it's client side. That's not going to work for us. So you know what? Let's go get our own thing. Let's just build our own tool internally because we can do something really easily. And, you know, we can have a, a treatment assignment mechanism or, or, and do some analysis and something like that. And then you end up having like three tools at one program and nobody knows what, what each one is doing. With varying levels of sophistication and statistical understanding because the exactly. teams that are managing both don't have the right mix of uh, resources and skills supporting them. Yep. Um, okay, uh, Merit asks, uh, you pointed out that product teams want to measure lifetime value, retention, satisfaction. Those hmm. metrics are notoriously difficult to measure uh, reliably uh, in any kind of experimentation program. What have you seen as effective ways of doing so? So um, metric design, to give you a little bit of background about uh, the analysis and experimentation team of Microsoft, one of the things that we spend the most time doing is working with our partner teams, uh, our customers, our internal customers at Microsoft on metric design. So we have 42 data scientists, something like 50% of them are PhDs in statistics. And what they are primarily focusing on is how do we build um, good metrics that actually uh, represent uh, what the, the business team actually wants to measure. It is it is 100% um, not an easy task. Uh, Bing in particular has about 3,000 metrics. And uh, that's, that's kind of a whole other thing in, in terms of how they make decisions based on those 3,000 metrics. Some of that is trade secret, um, but they do have a, a huge amount of them. Um, one thing that I find is important is that there's, only, there's really only so much that you can do with sort of the, the standard sort of logging mechanisms that come with like an Optimizely or Google Analytics or something like that. So we do a lot of custom telemetry where we are, are building out very, very detailed tracking and we're actually running experiments on our tracking. So we're running experiments on our ability, like we'll design a metric in two different ways and then run an experiment where the treatment is that metric collected in a different way and say, which one of these do we think is more accurate? Um, I, I definitely think like it's, it's not something that I have like an easy answer for, but I would say that you just need to, you need to put the time into really thinking about um, what your metrics are and asking people tough questions if the things they're measuring really measure what they are expecting. Right. Okay. Um, we'll let you guys know again there, you've got time for questions, um, but I'm going to go over to those, our pre uh, discussed questions here. Um, do you want to share with us how Microsoft handles some of the cultural technical challenges between the, the different types of testing and the different teams? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's a few things that we, that we try to do to bridge that gap. You can think of the analysis and experimentation team as a center of excellence. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of one of the models that, that Microsoft tried to um, pioneer in a lot and of ways. This, that team that you just described, the, the, you called them analytics and optimis or experimentation? Yeah, uh, analysis and experimentation, yep. What type of testing are they doing or is it all? 
all. So, so that's, that's my team and we, we run the platform. And so one of our charters as the platform owners is to try to get as many teams as Microsoft to run as many experiments as they can. And Microsoft is kind of an interesting beast. Uh, it's unlike a lot of, it's not like a Netflix or it's not like a, a Facebook because uh, Microsoft is actually many, uh, many almost completely independent organizations. Xbox is a very different organization from Bing, which is a very different organization from Skype, right? So there's many different data sources as well, and there's many different levels of maturity. Um, and so where, we've been fo where we focus a, a huge amount of our effort is um, let's try to help these different teams build a metric pipeline um, to help them get onboarded into the tool and to do a lot of the education on uh, what they should be testing, what are the metrics they should be uh, using, and, and what type of experiments should they be running and how to, how to analyze them. Um, in the beginning, we'll do some of that work for them, but gradually we want them to move into more of a, uh, of a, of a self-service um, environment. Gotcha. Uh, Jason McGovern uh, is asking, for feature validation, is it basically canary testing on a small percentage of the target audience? Um, I'm not sure what canary testing is. Jason, you want to explain? Hey, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Hey, uh, so thanks for taking my question. Um, kind of like just, you know, like when in the old coal mines, you take a canary down and, you know, see if anything's, you know, if the canary dies, uh, you know, something's bad going on here. Basically, when you did your example, it sounded like you were saying, hey, we're splitting it 50-50, and we're losing that 50% where we could have just been gaining that the whole time. I guess my question mm. is, are you, you're not doing that like on the 100% of the audience, are you? Or are you recommending like just enough to get stat sig or something like that? Yep, 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 that's exactly right. Um, so one of the, one of the, one of the um, features that our tool has is something called uh, progressions. And, I, I think in, in, in most tools, you can usually set like, what is the, what is the percentage of traffic we're actually running this test on? Um, we actually try to do something a little bit different where we have um, rings, um, actual like rings of users that the test will target at a certain percentage, and then it will progress through that percentage gradually until it reaches 50-50 or whatever it is that the experimenter actually sets, and then it moves on to the, re to the next ring. So for example, if I was running a test on the analysis and experimentation team, I could set up a, an experiment that only goes out to the people directly on, my, on, the, on the product management team, which would be like 10 people. And then if it passes that with whatever parameters that I want, then it goes out to the entire analysis and experimentation team, which is like 110 people. And then if it passes that, it could go out to the entire AI platform org, which is what we are a part of. Um, and then if it passes that, I could say, you know, go out to all of Microsoft. And then if it passes that, I could say, okay, now go out to um, uh, production and start at half a percent and gradually increase by half a percent until it's up to 50%. Um, and we have a really, really strong uh, gating and alerting mechanism to where if at any point during that cycle, our, the, the sort of primary indicators of our uh, business success, like revenue, um, a lot of performance metrics, if those dip, dip below some standard deviation, then the test just shuts off immediately. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's exactly that. It's starting at a really, really low percent. And if we have any egregious errors, it turns things off and it sends an alert uh, to the person who started it and said, hey, there's, there's a really big problem here. Uh, maybe you want to dial this one back. Can I ask one follow-up? Yeah, go ahead, Jason. So when you're at that very low level, when you're first starting out, are you looking at qualitative feedback at that point to know whether to go from 10 to 110 or something other than like, you know, quantitative feedback? No, we're still using quantitative. So the, the idea is, is um, egregious errors, right? So if, if something is really egregious and you gotta, you gotta, you know, you gotta remember Microsoft is um, massive, massive, massive company. So there's no way we could ever, if we, if we put out something and if we put out an experiment and it caused a live site issue at 50% of traffic, um, our team is all fired. <laughs> so, uh, so, so if what we take a, a super, super safe approach and say, like, let's say, um, some issue we've, we've pushed some code 
that affects 20, that, that causes a negative 20% drop in revenue. Um, we can start to see the warning signs of that pretty early, right? Like, so if we, if we cause some error to happen or some bug where a page doesn't load or something like that, then we can actually catch that at, you know, a hundred people, which is, which is pretty close to qualitative, I guess. It's just that the numbers are so big that we can detect it even at a small sample size. Um, so once we get to the Microsoft rings and we're talking about, you know, I think Microsoft has 150,000 people in it. So once we get out to, you know, 10, 20,000 people in a Microsoft ring, then, you know, if there are those really, really large egregious errors that would cost people their jobs, if it hit a uh, live site, then, or if it hit production, then um, we, we could usually catch those. All right. Um, so if you're working on the marketing side of the business or if you're working on the product side of the business, um, at least in my experience, uh, your situation is somewhat unique that all experimentation funnels through a single program. Typically, what we see with a lot of our clients is that the marketing team is owning one type of optimization, typically client side. And the product team, if they're doing testing, are doing some kind of server side um, product validation, beta rollout, canary testing, uh, feature flagging, whatever they're calling it, and they, they don't talk. And if they do talk, it's, it's not a positive conversation and there's a competition of resources and, and that sort of thing. So, in, you know, what, what would you suggest as a good way to get those teams talking to each other and why they should? And, and maybe, I mean, obviously you have it kind of easy because it's all under you. But in a scenario where that's not possible, what would you say to each of those teams about why they should talk to each other? Like what could product get from marketing and what could marketing get from product? Yeah, I, yeah, I think that's, um, I think that's a great question. Um, I think, I think, so I was, I kind of have two, really three individual sets of advice here. I think the first set of advice is it, when you're in a scenario where you haven't quite made the jump to experimentation, embracing experimentation as your, as your organization yet, mm -hmm. um, that is the, that is the best possible time to get alignment really, really early. Yeah. Uh, what I see happens is people say, Hey, we, we, especially in marketing, Hey, we want to do, we want to do AB testing. So let's have all our marketing people and our digital marketing people sort of meet up together and, you know, do a whole bunch of product evaluations and then go out and talk to Adobe and talk to Optimizely and they'll walk us through some demos and that's cool. And, you know, maybe we'll have like one technical person on or something like that from our side or maybe one or two or something like that. And then we'll go and get our budget and we'll pay for it and then, and then we'll use it. Um, I think, I think that's, that's the problem. <laughs> like that initial step has already sort of moved things in a bad direction uh, because the only, really the only outcome once engineering starts to get involved is either walking the decision back or engineering saying we're doing our own thing, right? That's, that's really all that happens. Um, so if they're brought in from the beginning, then both sides can um, sort of state their case and decide what they really need. I think in many cases, especially in, in where, where you have these sort of tier three companies, marketing is, is in a great place because marketing still controls the purse strings in, in the majority of cases. So what they can do is you can bring engineering to the table. You can say, okay, hey guys, we want to do A-B testing. It's going to affect all of us. What is the best solution for the problems that we have? Let's get one tool and let's figure out a way for marketers to be able to do their thing and for developers to be able to do their thing and for all of us to have insight into what's going on. That, that is the type of problem that an engineering team would love to solve. With some um, kind of cross team steering collaborative group that is prioritizing and evaluating. Exactly. Okay. It, exactly. Um, I, think, I think if you're already at a point where that decision has been made, uh, which is, which is, uh, then, then things are going to be a little bit tougher. Yeah. Um, things are going to be a, a little bit tougher in that case. And it kind of depends on sort of how far gone they are in some ways. If you've got, uh, if you've got an engineering team and they're running, you know, 500 experiments a year and they're really, really invested in the tool, it's going to be hard. And, and uh, it, it, it actually kind of makes sense because they're usually doing something more robust than marketing's doing anyway. It's going to be really hard for them to walk back their thing and say, okay, well, we're, we'll use your thing now and, and vice versa. Um, 
so I, I think at that point, it's still good to get the alignment. Like it's still good to get everybody in a room and say, what is it about our tool marketing or um, engineering that prevents you from, from doing your job? Uh, is there any way that we could combine? I think that uh, a great outcome would be, and this is something that we actually had at Sephora, so certainly something that we were, we were very strongly working towards, is a single tool that engineering and marketing could use um, that was had a, a, a bit of a bit of a third party influence and there was a bit of, of custom work um, like within our CMS tool that allowed marketers to generate these experiments via feature flags um, well, like without having a lot of dev input like you like these solutions are possible but there needs to be resources allocated to actually finding that solution so it all comes back to the that overarching group that is sort of managing and integrating in the cross collaboration. It yeah, always comes back to process and governance. Nobody wants to talk about it, but that's what it always comes back to. Mm -hmm. It's less so much less about the technology itself. Yep, I agree. All right. Well, let's see. Any more questions in the Slack? No. Okay. Um, let, one question that I asked as part of that larger question that I don't think we got to was what learnings could marketing share with product and product mm. share with marketing to yeah. lift each other's um, work? So I think, uh, I, I definitely think that, a uh, so it, it, this kind of goes back to that, that slide that I had on the, the cars where you have what are what are the the roles and responsibilities that each group is really responsible for mm -hmm. in most cases i think that marketing usually has a pretty good understanding oftentimes better than product of uh who is buying this usually marketing has a pretty tighter communication with the sales team as well so there's a lot of like qualitative feedback uh there i think product is usually good at um, responding to uh, live sites of like error rates of uh, sometimes looking at lifetime value but uh, not not super frequently of looking at things like churn and retention and stuff like that um, I think that there is sort of the a, a, a major value in optimizing for uh, the short term in some ways but just being able to measure the short term better um, like things like value propositions uh, are not things that product teams are usually super concerned about, right? If you're uh, usually it's more like, okay, how is this feature doing? Um, but like, let's say that you've built a new feature. There's a lot of alignment that I think should happen there between the marketing teams and product teams on what are the different ways that we could potentially be selling this feature to people um, on, on the marketing aspect of the website. If I'm, if I'm, if I know the outcome of, uh, if I'm a marketer and if I know the outcome of an experiment on a particular feature, then I can say, oh, well, well, very, very clearly, uh, this is a, a new potential persona. This is a new way that we could phrase things. This is a new way that we could phrase things. And then we could generate some, we could, I could funnel more people into your product and all of your metrics would go up as well. Um, right. So I think, I think that's sort of the, the funnel from marketing to, to product and, and sort of vice versa. Yeah, I, I commonly hear people talk, you know, which should come first? Should you, should the product engineering team, you know, uh, do the, the beta rollout, the canary test and the feature flagging to get the product out there and then optimization and marketing work to optimize it? Or should marketing and optimization feed the design of the new feature? Um, and I would argue it's all of the above. It's, it, I, think it's, I think it's a mistake to think it's A then B. It's, it should be very, very ingrained. And you know, what the, the uh, marketing and optimization team is learning should absolutely feed what the engineering team is building. And what the engineering team is building should feed what's coming next for optimization and the optimization roadmap at all times. Um, and I, I think everybody's missing out if we're not talking. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's really like in a lot of cases, it's just a resourcing thing. There's yeah. only so many hours a day that, I mean, I think, I think oftentimes what happens is specifically in product management, some PMs will say, oh, well, you know, it's my job to understand what the value proposition should be. It's like, well, that's cool. But if you, if you also have to deal with 
looking at the feature roadmap and looking at all the analytics for your product and going to meetings and having to argue for why this is more this should be prioritized over that you don't have you don't have the time to do all the user research that's involved with understanding the 25 different ways that you could position one particular feature in your product marketing can do that that's something that's um, that not only can they do but in a lot of ways they they enjoy doing that and coming up with those types of experiments um, so I think sometimes practically it just it just makes sense to split the work that way absolutely well we we are at time I want to thank you Jason had one more question that's in the TLC calls if Chad if you want to go into the TLC calls channel and uh, respond to that and sure. everybody continue the conversation on the slack as always really really thank you for coming back for sharing that again um, again I will put the recording up on the YouTube channel and I'll post it in the slack and send an email to everybody so that you have that recording and uh, next up in June and July is we're still negotiating on on times and which conversation is going to happen in which month but as soon as I have that information I'll post it on the TLC planning channel so thanks everybody have a great weekend and happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. <laughs>